John, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's All do right. it. I'm going to move my camera just a hair. There we go. All right. So thank you so much for joining everybody. This is kind of a quick impromptu webcast. Um, we've really been burning the midnight oil uh, at BHIS Anti-Siphon uh, by coming up with live streams. Uh, if you haven't seen our live streams on Twitch, we'll put up a link for that. But we do live streams on Twitch that are little 30-minute, tight, dense, technical nuggets. Um, and we do those every week on Tuesday and Wednesday. Monday, of course, is the news. So we've been doing a lot of those, and we haven't done a lot of webcasts. And webcasts are really the bread and butter that we built BHIS on. So what I wanted to do is take some of the slides from my intro to pen testing class uh, that I just ended up uh, writing like three weeks ago. And I wanted to throw them together and specifically talk about areas of worst customer experiences, how things have gone wrong, and more importantly, how we can avoid making those same types of mistakes in the industry. And this applies not just for a commercial pen testing firm, but any organization that does security assessments. So the concepts of communication, the concepts of you know, setting up proper rules of engagement and scope it are concepts that transcend doing a simple consultant external third-party pen test but apply to internal organizations as well. So I'll be sharing a lot of stories with these slides on how things came about the way that they came about. And almost everything that we talk about here um, in this next hour are really stories and they're things that came about because I have been burnt um, in tests or people that I work with or friends of mine that own pen testing companies that they've worked with, they've been burnt as well. So we're going to try to talk about this to really help people understand and avoid the mistakes that I've fallen into. Now, I want to talk about where we were back whenever I first started doing pen testing. Right? When I first started doing pen testing for Anderson Consulting and Accenture, it was in 2001. All right. That's a really freaking long time ago. And to give you an idea where I was at like 22 years ago, one of the first things that I was asked by my technical manager to do was to run Cisco NetRanger, which is like Nessus, but Cisco's product, which was really expensive back in the day, and run NetRanger against all IP addresses. And I remember asking the question, what are our IP addresses? And he said, I don't know run it against all IP addresses. And like the scan was set up to go to 0.0.0.0 to 255.255.255.255. So they were literally planning on scanning 4.2 billion IP addresses with Cisco NetRanger. So that is what you know we were doing back in like 22 years ago. Um, and I'm, that's not one of the mistakes that is in here. I don't have a slide that's like, don't scan the entire freaking internet. We don't have that um, as a slide, but I'm setting the stage. I've been here a long time. And even whenever I was pen testing with Northrop Grumman and Accenture, the whole skill set of being a penetration tester or being an ethical hacker was this weird skill set that you hid. Like you didn't go around telling people it's like, oh, I'm a hacker because in mixed company and IT, there was literally nothing good about being a hacker back then. Uh, immediately, uh, one of the one of the first incidents I ever worked years ago um, at Department of Interior, one of the managers accused me of doing the hack simply because I was all, the only hacker that he knew that was in the vicinity because they got compromised. They're like, where's the nearest hacker? That guy. Let's blame him. So that's where things were a long, 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 long time ago. And if you go from that to working at Northrop Grumman to starting up Black Hills Information Security, at Black Hills Information Security, we've been in business over 15 years. We have done thousands of tests. About, we're now at about 650, 700 that we do per year. And there's firms that are bigger, you know, just giving you an idea of rough orders of magnitude. I would say there's five bad things. Five absolutely horrific things that happened when we're doing testing, working with customers and things that occurred that I look back at and I cringe. And I will be sharing some of those with you today, um, but only five. 
like seriously five really bad things that have happened. Um, I would say that there's dozens of little annoyances when we're working with customers and something starts going sideways and how this, uh, you know, how communication worked or expectation management or all of these different things. Um, there's a few dozen little annoyances that didn't really put the entire contract or the company at risk. But the big thing that I want you to take away from this is there's literally thousands of things that make me smile. There's literally thousands of tests and customers that we've worked with. Whenever we talk about them internally at Black Hills Information Security, they make us smile. And it, we, it's really affirming working with people. Like we say, we want to do cool stuff with cool people and working with cool companies and cool people at these companies with a goal and objective of actually doing good security, not just meeting the minimum, not just doing checkbox computer security, but doing the right thing is the overwhelmingly large, vast majority of the customers that we work with at Black Hills Information Security. So I really want to stress that because you know, anything you 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 can say will be used against you in a court of law. Isn't that right, Alex Jones? Um, anything you can say will be used against you in a court of law. And I really want to get away from uh, like judging people on their failures. So I'm going to share those failures that I have made so that you will not make those same mistakes. One of the things I say quite a bit is to become truly adept at laughing at others. You must practice on yourself first. Uh, so I'm going to give you all the opportunity at laughing at me. Um, so we're going to give you an opportunity to see the things that I made. And some of you may look at this and just say, well, he's clearly incompetent. He's a moron. If that's what you take from this and that makes you smile at the end of the day, fantastic. That's great. Um, the preferred thing for me is it makes us all grow and get better. So one of the things I want to set the stage of is whenever we're doing penetration tests, a penetration test is not a penetration test is a penetration test is a penetration test. Um, in the industry over the past 22 years, there's been this amazing evolution of clarity and focus whenever it comes to the different types of testing that can be done. When, when I started doing this years ago, it was literally all zero days, going to packet storm security, pulling down C code, compiling C code, launching attacks. And it was all about the Marcus Random sucky pen test. And Marcus Random said, traditionally, pen tests prove one of two things. Either A, the pen tester sucks because they couldn't get in, or B, the company sucks because the pen tester got in. And that type of binary view of the success of a penetration test was incredibly toxic in the industry, but that's literally what drove this industry, I would say, starting at about 2000, all the way up until around 2005, six timeframe. Um, that's how most tests were ran. It was like, we want you to hack us and break in. And if you didn't, then they would make fun of you and they maybe wouldn't pay you. It was tough. It was really, really, really tough back then. And to be honest, a lot of testers they weren't doing themselves any favors whatsoever uh, because they were constantly trying to live up and be the hype of that type of assessment. You know, they're elite. They could hack anything at any time. They had to have the attitude. And that was really more of a protective skin, more so than it was actually based in any type of reality, right? So when you're working with a test, and this works for your internal companies, sometimes people in a company really don't know what they want. Like they could just say, we need a pen test, but that could literally mean any number of different things, right? It could mean they really just want a vulnerability analysis. They want someone to run a vulnerability scan against their environment and identify vulnerabilities. It could mean when they say, I want a pen test, that they want an external pen test where they run a scan, they look for vulnerabilities, exploit the vulnerabilities and try to identify risk. If they say, we want a pen test, it could mean that they want an assumed compromise assessment where a tester already has access to a workstation in their environment and they're moving laterally. Or they could say, we want a pen test. And what it means is that they want a red team where the team comes in like a real threat actor unannounced and tries to bypass their controls. Or they could say, we want a pen test. And what they really want is a collaborative engagement, working with the red team and their blue team to kind of try to work together to find stimulus response and gaps in their environment. It is your job as testers 
whether you're doing an internal test, whether you're working as an external consultant, or if you are a company looking for an engagement with an external third-party firm or internal resources to know exactly what it is that you're looking for. And if you don't, having a conversation with an offensive security professional can help. I feel like I'm a realtor. You should have a call with a realtor today, but find an offensive security professional and have a conversation. One of the key themes that I'm going to be hitting on throughout all of these slides is the importance and the criticality of communication. The vast majority of problems, like I said, five bad problems, a couple of dozen like annoying problems, almost every single one of them goes back to a communication breakdown. And I'm going to talk more about that here in a couple of slides. And they almost always go back to CJ is on this call as the CEO of Black Hills Information Security. He's always trying to find when things go wrong, where did communication break down? Where did it break down between the customer and the tester, the tester and the customer, so that we can constantly do better? Because if you scope properly at the beginning and you identify what the customer is looking for, something like 98%, I'm pulling that number out of my ass, of the problems that you have with a customer by setting up the right type of engagement disappear almost instantaneously by having the proper communications up front. But I want you to look at this pyramid, right? So if we're looking at this pyramid, one of the problems that you're going to run into is some customers, as soon as they detect you, they think they've won. Like they immediately see an attack from an IP address, say it's from Black Hills Information Security, they block it, they start high-fiving, they're popping champagne, like, ah, they're all crazy and they're all happy. But anytime that that happens with a customer and they get all excited about detecting us, there's been problems. And ultimately, those problems came down to communication. So if we're doing something like an internal network penetration test or an external network penetration test, that really isn't stealthy. A vulnerability analysis, totes not stealthy whatsoever. We aren't trying to be stealthy. Even assumed compromise testing in most situations isn't stealthy. Purple team, almost never stealthy. So when you're looking at a customer that gets really excited because they caught you and you were firing up Nessus, it's easy to say, well, that pen testing company sucks because we were able to detect them. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It goes back to expectations management. So we have an ROE template that I share in my intro to pen testing class that we share a condensed version of it. And the big part of that is sitting and going through and saying, what are you expecting? Uh, do you expect that you should work with us and we should work with detections? They're going to go back and forth. Are you trying to make it super stealthy? One of the hours that we're allowed to actually do testing. And I can give you a couple of stories on how this went horribly, like really wrong. All right. First story is we were doing an assessment against a, a cloud like e like e commerce site. Okay, uh, fairly large, not maybe not a household name, but a fairly large e commerce website. And one of our testers actually set up a particular attack utilizing Google um, to basically intercept two factor authentication because the customer was using Google with two-factor authentication. And he came up with a really creative way of bypassing two-factor authentication against Google Apps domains. He set it up with a personal email account that was by a burner account on a completely separate domain from Black Hills Information Security, basically worked all of that out to launch the attack at this particular organization, launched the attack at this organization. It was successful and Google saw it. Google saw the attack, contacted our point of contact at the customer and said, hey, y'all, uh, we noticed this attack is, is up and running against your organization. This attack was pioneered by Black Hills Information Security. Are they currently testing you? Now, this particular customer said, well, this customer thought to themselves, they're like, this is an awesome opportunity. We can find out what does Google do if they see an attack coming against our organization? So they responded back to Google, no, we have no contract with Black Hills Information Security to test us at this time. 
Google was able to track that email back to the tester's house. And yes, he was going through proxies. They were able to identify all of his like wife's email accounts, his kids' email accounts, his Black Hills information security email accounts, and they locked all of the accounts down. Then they came back to Black Hills information security and they locked us out of our domain as well. All because of a customer lying and saying that they were not actively being tested by Black Hills information security. In fact, I had to contact my friends at Google, contact them, and share with them the signature page of the contract to show them that we were, in fact, authorized to test this organization for Google to unlock our entire account. This whole entire problem was expectations management. This whole entire problem was proper communication back and forth with the customer about what they were expecting. So. You have to be careful because there can be consequences for you doing testing and not being explicit in your early stage communications about what the customer is and is not expecting to get out of this test. And in our ROE template, we literally have a question. If you're working with third-party providers, is there a proper notification? If they detect the attack, how do you want us to handle this? How, do you, how are you going to handle this? And so on. Setting all of that up front is absolutely essential. And yeah, you still may have customers that'll burn you and throw you under the cart or throw you under the bus, but at least you have some level of recourse and some level of explanation for the cloud vendor. One of the things we talk about is objectives and targets, right? We want to make recommendations for protecting key company assets. And, you know, I got a little bit salty on, on the news last Monday, but I think it's difficult whenever people are looking at threat actors and they make an assumption about the techniques that threat actors use, that threat actors are always going to use the exact same types of techniques. And there may be threat actors that do that. But a real threat actor is going to utilize every single vulnerability that is at their disposal in order to try to attack your organization. Let me say that again. A real threat actor is going to use any vulnerabilities at their disposal to try to break into your organization. When we're talking about a targeted, real person, hands-on keyboard attack, that's just what they're going to do. And we as testers need to know what are the key company assets that you're the most concerned about an attacker actually getting access to it. Because we want to go down the right path. Uh, let me give you an example. We were doing a test against a, a power company on the East Coast, fairly large power company. And as part of this test, the testers quickly got access to the point where they could take over the entire power grid and shut power down to a large percentage of people in a geographic location. We contacted the customer. We're like, yo, we got access to this. This is bad. And the customer was basically like, hmm, okay. Yeah, well, good job. Um, keep us posted. I'll just be over here playing Fruit Ninja. Just kind of do, 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 do. Good job. We were dumbfounded. We made an assumption as a testing company that the ability to shut down the power grid would be the most important thing. We didn't even ask. Like, we didn't even have that conversation. We we're like, yeah, you know, shutting down power. That's what you do. That would be bad if that happened. And they're like, no, whatever. Good job. Testers went on a little bit further and they gained access to an Excel spreadsheet that had salary information for every employee at this organization and bonuses associated with the employees at this organization. All hell broke loose. We had executives on the call with an emergency meeting in the middle of the night. We were going through all of this. They demanded to know who exactly had access to the spreadsheet and when they had access to the spreadsheet. They wanted a forensics investigation to see who had downloaded the spreadsheet. How did the spreadsheet actually get there? There was panic and whoa. That, that is what mattered to them far more than anything else. And we're just sitting and we're watching all of this happen. And we're like, by the way, um, your entire power grid is completely exposed and someone can shut it down. And they're like, yeah, shut up, hippie. Excel spreadsheet was like, like payroll information. That was what was most important to them, right? Um, so that was scary. Now, as part of the objectives and targets, as you're going towards that objective, 
I couldn't just put it. I wanted to find out if I could put it in blinky lights. And I tried for like 30 seconds, didn't even Google it. And I gave up. So I just did it in a rainbow. Anytime that you're working a test, you need to provide evidence of the effectiveness of current defensive mechanisms and attack detection methodologies. Like that should like be tattooed on every pen tester someplace. Like, oh yeah, well, okay. Um, I've got it on my belly and so I can read it like the TCP IP thing on the shirt. Provide evidence of the effectiveness of current defensive mechanisms and attack detection methodologies. You see, we're not just doing a test for the purposes of proving that we can hack. We're trying to identify those weaknesses, but we are also trying to give a statement to that organization's management about what is working. If your whole entire goal and objective for doing a pen test is to basically show that your customers suck at computer security, get the hell out of the industry. You're not doing anyone any favors except for your ego. Your id is like super happy. It's like, yes, yes. <laughs> Our goal and objective is to identify gaps and weaknesses. Our goals and objectives are also to help organizations identify what is working because they're going to use that to make budgetary decisions moving forward in the future. And we want to assist with those budgetary decisions as well. So. What are the things that you're going to run into? Like the absolute, like most consistent problem that you're going to run into, hands down, is customers not ready. Whether it's internal, your own organization, or as an external third-party firm, customers going to be not ready. You're going to say you're going to have the rules of engagement. You're going to have the scope. You're going to have the contract. You're going to set up dates. It's going to be Friday before the test. Then the customer is going to send you an email. And they're going to say something like, "Oh, by the way, the app uh, isn't ready, or the you know the systems team isn't ready for this test." Or you're going to start testing, and you're going to realize an app isn't functional. You're going to realize your RDP access, VPN access into the testing host that they set up for you is not ready. This is without question the most consistent problem that we encounter whenever we're doing testing. Now, I want to, I want to drive a couple of things home. One, and this is critical, you should have a finding in your report, something like customer preparedness for testing. It needs to be in the report that the customer was not ready and can be in the executive statement. It should also be an informational finding that this organization was not ready for the test to occur because you more than likely will do some testing, but the amount of testing that you are going to do is going to be reduced. And I'm going to talk more about this on a couple of slides here in a couple of moments. So the other reason why this needs to be in the report from the company perspective is this is basically designed to cover your assets. Be I wanna set up a scenario and this crap has happened to us where a customer has hired us, they weren't ready for a test, they cut let's say 30, 40% of the testing out because they weren't ready. And we put it in the report, hey, we weren't able to test everything because the customer was not ready for testing. And six months later, they get hacked. And immediately, as soon as a hack happens, they want to go around and they want to find who they can blame for this, this hack that happened in their organization. And they're going to start reaching for the pen testing firm. And they're going to start asking questions about why didn't you all find this vulnerability that the hackers used and leveraged to gain access to the environment? If you don't have that in your report, you're going to get burnt and you're going to get burnt badly. If it's in your report, then it's easy. If it ever goes to a court of law, you could be like, your honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, they weren't ready for testing. So we weren't able to test absolutely everything that was required. And they didn't hire us for the additional hours to do the testing that is required in order to find these particular vulnerabilities. So this becomes the cover your assets type thing just to protect yourself if the customer isn't ready. Now, as soon as something like this starts happening, you even get a whiff of it, notify management. Um, we do this in Black Hills Information Security. You need to notify like CJ, myself, or any of the other people that are in the, in the, um, um, in the uh, consulting team so that they can have direct communications with the powers that be that are basically saying, y'all, we, we need to get running. Because what the customer is going to do is the customer is going to be like, well, if you're not, if we're not ready on Monday, can you guys just do like 
an extra like few hours every single night to get caught up? No, we are not shift workers. We are not people that are making widgets and they put in extra overtime to get caught up. Security assessment professionals and security professionals are highly trained professionals. You don't keep highly trained professionals by constantly going back to them and saying, hey, the customer's not ready. Can you put in an extra eight to 10 hours of overtime this week, cutting into family activities, cutting into your hobbies, cutting into your downtime? If you're working at a firm that asks you to do that, you need to start working with your management to stop that. You do. Um, you have to. And trust me, it does happen at Black Hills Information Security. The testers feel bad for the customer and they try to do what they can do. But you need to understand that you can let the customer know that they but not being ready is going to impact the report. It's going to impact the quality of the test. And you are not to break yourself as a tester to try to make this stuff work. Now, I got to be honest, the Black Hills Information Security over the years, when I first started and we were running this, we would absolutely try to break ourselves on rocks, you know, to make it up to the customer, uh, to try to do right by the customer. I realized once we started pushing back two amazing things. The first thing was very rarely did a customer ever go, well, that's just horrible customer service. It's exceedingly rare for them to do that. Many of the customers understand that that things are out of their control, uh, mainly because they're wor working with like the systems team, operations team, network team, and they understand that. The other thing that we've discovered is if you go back to the customer, you're like, yeah, absolutely, we can do this. However, it is going to take you know, additional hours at the end of the test. We can get it scheduled in, and it's going to be part of the hourly rate in the statement of work. So we're literally going to just have a contract modification that says we'll come back and do this testing when the customer is, is, is ready. That's absolutely essential. And we have found vast majority of times, like in the 90s, the customer may gripe a little bit, but they'll basically sign off on that additional testing to get done. So it's not as bad as you would expect it to be. And one of the analogies, I think CJ is the one that came up with this, when the customer is like, oh, well, we're not ready. Um, how about we just move it, you know, three months out down the line? Um, look at hotels. Like if you reserve a hotel room and you show up the day of the hotel reservation and you basically say, hey, I'm not going to stay here. Can I get my money back? They're going to charge you for that first day. Almost any major hotel brand out there, absolutely well. They have cancellation policies. So why should cancellation policies for highly professional, super well-trained companies to do this type of assessment be any worse than what exists in like the hospitality industry. It's just bad form all the way across. Now, this slide easily fits into this slide, constantly fits into this slide. Burnout is real. Burnout is absolutely a real thing when it comes to testers. And I want to give you two separate examples on how burnout happens. Two opposite ends of the spectrum, burnout happens all the time. Okay. First one in things are going first one is things are going great. And they're only getting better. I'm doing all right. I'm getting good grades. I've got to wear shades. The tester is testing. They're popping shells. They're getting domain administrator in multiple different ways. They're finding brand new zero days and hence unknown vulnerabilities that people hadn't seen ever in the history of computer security. That tester in those tests, many times, will put in a tremendous amount of overtime because they're having so much fun. So you look at their timesheet and you're like, holy crap, you put in 15 hours on Tuesday? And they're like, yeah, but get this. And they talk about all these amazing vulnerabilities that they're identifying in this organization. We need to push back and say, look, you need to keep it, try to keep it to eight hours, nine hours. Don't burn your, no, 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 no. This is awesome. That's on one end of the spectrum. That's the happy end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum is this test is kicking my ass. I'm not getting anywhere. So I've got to put in more time because the customer can't win. I've got to get in and prove that I'm a lead hacker. I've got to get in. So they put in 15 hours on Tuesday or Wednesday. So this is a catch. If you're going in and you're testing hard and you're having great success, much success, you're going to put in overtime. If you're getting like absolutely smoked by the customer, can't have that, can't lose you're going to put in a lot of overtime. So you're screwed either way. 
So one of the things that we are always trying to do to try to get our testers to do better is trying to learn to leave some things behind. Set up to find hours that you're going to work, like say nine to five, just keep it simple. And when you're done working, go exercise. It could just be a walk. It could be a run. You could go lifting with Dave Kennedy. I don't care. You need to have a definitive break in your day. That is that delineation between work time and me time. Get a hobby, have a family, have friends, get a life. And underneath, underneath matchstick, a matchstick woman over here, these are the quotes that are like danger quotes at Black Hills Information Security. Whenever we talk about how much time people are putting in. No, 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 it's cool. I love what I do. I love what I do. I'm having a great time. Another quote, I would do this on my own time. I do this for fun. I do capture the flags. Oh, I can't believe this. And the bottom one is, don't worry about me. I'll be okay. That bottom one happens all the damn time. We're constantly fighting this issue. And for most testers, this is self-inflicted because they feel like they owe it to a customer or they owe it to the company or they owe it to their other testers to put in a ridiculous amount of overtime. And I will tell you that almost universally, if you start putting in a lot of overtime, the quality of the work that comes out of that starts to drop off precipitously. So you need to try to find those places where you can break up and say, this is my work day, this is my family day. And here's a weird thing that happens. Whenever you split that time and you go into home mode, this is weird. Many of you are still working. You're sitting there stirring spaghetti noodles, thinking about what happened in the organization while you were testing. Um, you're watching, you know, Breaking Bad again for the 15th time. And you're thinking about, well, what if I use the wrong switch with this particular tool? Maybe it wasn't compiled correctly. Maybe I'd... you're still working. I know that about a lot of you in computer security, whether you're defense, whether you're offense, it's hard to shut down. And with that in mind, sometimes stepping back Getting away from the keyboard is where clarity comes and usually good ideas come from it. So you need that separation. You need that space. You need the room to breathe as a tester. So let's talk about burnout. I want you to think about time. Your tests that you work on as a tester, customers are paying for your time. Or more accurately, the company you're working for is paying for your time to test this application. That's, that's your commodity. That's your life. That's what you bring to the table. They're paying for that. In exchange of you giving up your time, they're giving you money. Now, one of the things I talk about with testers all the time is they say, oh, well, you know, you know, I, I did this test and it was two weeks and I feel like I didn't have enough time and I could have done a better job. And CJ is one of the best people for saying this. There is no way any test that you ever do is ever over. I never hear a tester say, yep, I did this test. Feel like I had plenty of time, found absolutely everything. And I researched all the vulnerabilities that I was interested in. It was great. It was always, I could have done better. I could have put in more time. I could have found more things. It's not a damn Easter egg hunt. You're not ever, ever in a pen test going to go through and identify every Easter egg, every vulnerability, every missing patch, every single exploit that exists in every single application. There is no end to that crap. We're there to assess, identify gaps and weaknesses. We are not necessarily there to identify every freaking vulnerability. We're there to identify what are the gaps and weaknesses in this organization's policies, processes, and procedures that allow these particular vulnerabilities to manifest in the organization. And we're working with them to try to develop these controls, be it patching, vulnerability management, user awareness training, that they can improve to reduce their risk profile. All right? No test is ever done. If you're working overtime, you're only hurting yourself. Even if you're getting paid, for your overtime, you are hurting yourself. You are hurting your family. You are hurting your kids. You are hurting your pets. You are doing damage that is irrevocable that'll impact you for the rest of your damn life. And I'm speaking from experience on this. Like when I, when I was, whenever I started Black Hills Information Security, I was teaching for the Sands Institute. I was traveling and teaching up to a 15 to 20 times per year just to make ends meet. 
And for many of those engaged, many of those SANS classes that I was teaching, I would go out to eat and I would go back and I would work until two o'clock in the morning just to get a test done. And I would suck. Like, just so you know, quality of my work back then was garbage because I taught all day. I was exhausted. I didn't have the mental capacity to think things through. Quality of work was horrific. And I spent just a tremendous tremendous amount of time away from my wife and my kids. It got so bad, folks, that I would drink, not heavily, I would drink. And then after a while, I started getting suicidal for no good reason. It impacted me heavily. And I know that for many of you, you feel like you're working overtime. You feel like you're pushing yourself all the time to do a good job, to be recognized as a team player. Don't. Just don't. People rip on millennials all the time because they have boundaries. They're like, well, I'm going to work 40 hours. People are like, oh, stupid millennials only putting in 40 hours. God damn right. We can learn something from millennials to identify boundaries and pushing back when those boundaries come in. This is critical for us and for our sanity. And there are firms out there And it may be like sparking some things with some of my friends, but there are firms out there that say, we pride ourselves on working 60 hours a week. We pride ourselves for putting in overtime because we put the company first and the mission of the company first. Almost every one of those damn companies, the actual real mission is making the principals that own the company more freaking money. That's it. And they try to push this attitude across the entire organization that everybody's got to put in a professional level of overtime. We got to pull together as a team. You need to help out Bill. Bill is putting in 60 hours. If you don't put in 60 hours, you're hurting Bill. F those companies. Nobody should ever work like that. Now, there are things that happen. I want to make it very clear. We have had things at Black Hills Information Security where a tester got sick, where a tester lost a family member, where something happens to a tester and other people step up. But it should be something that is not the norm. It should not be expected of you all the time. Try to keep your days to eight hours. Um, And at Black Hills, we're constantly fighting this, right? I mean, we have testers that love what they do. They have things that are going on. We're ramping up a bunch of new testers. And we have our senior testers that are trying to bring up these junior testers. And the junior testers are trying to learn. And you're going to have some overtime that's going to happen there. But goddamn, there has to be a light at the end of the tunnel. And that's something that the management of Black Hills Information Security worries about a tremendous amount. And there's times where it just doesn't happen. And, you know, we, we try to get there. And it's something that I'm constantly failing at. And it's something that constantly keeps me awake at night. Because rather than me feeling like, you know, my testers are letting me down because they're not putting in overtime, I feel like I'm letting my testers down because I have testers right now that are putting in overtime just to try to hold everything together. And, you know, it's something that eats me. And it's not perfect, but you should at least be working for a company that, that gives a crap and tries. So another thing for those of you that are doing this and you're talking about testing rabbit holes, right? Um, One of the big problems that we've seen over the years, and it's much, much, much better now um, because we've kind of implemented this particular policy across the organization is the five and five rule. So let me give you the worst case scenario. A tester is doing a test and they find a bright, shiny object. They find something that they think that they can exploit on Monday, and then they spend Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday trying to develop an exploit for that bright, shiny object that they discovered on Monday. They call me up on Friday and they say, ah, I'm not done with this test. I don't have enough time. I've been trying to write this exploit for this memory corruption vulnerability in this Telnet server, and I've almost got it working, and I haven't had time to work. Just stop, all right? You should not find a rabbit hole and go down that rabbit hole and spend a tremendous amount of time trying to fix or find that one vulnerability. So try five things, maybe five minutes or three and three rule. Try three things in three minutes. If it doesn't work, note it, continue going through with the test, and then circle back for your rabbit holes at the end. Trying to be comprehensive is absolutely essential when you're doing a security assessment. You want to make sure that you're covering as many of the bases as you can, not going super deep into all of them. You need to circle back to those things. And what's more than likely going to happen, you're going to ignore this rabbit hole. 
You're going to set it on the table, not ignore it, but you're going to table it. And then you're going to find another rabbit hole and you're going to get more like success out of that rabbit hole later on. So these are things that you want to do. Be comprehensive, go through that coverage. And if you have time, then circle back and you're going to say, I've got six rabbit holes. I feel really good about these two rabbit holes. These other three, I'm just going to document the customer should patch, update, change firewall rules, and then Maybe if I have time, I'll get to them. But we need to make sure that we get that coverage and we circle back because we've had situations in our tests where testers get stuck. They're not able to finish the test. Now I need to go back to the customer and I need to tell the customer we need more time. Now I need to pull another tester off of another engagement or have somebody else work over time to cover it. It's just ugly. So if you do the five and five rule on rabbit holes, so the three and three rule on rabbit holes, it helps reduce those particular problems that manifest. So what are the things we don't test? We don't test personal phones. We don't test some cloud services. We don't test third parties. We don't test family members. We don't test other personal devices. We don't DDoS. We don't test internet service providers. Now, if you look at the slide, which of these things is not like the other? Which of these things doesn't belong? Every single one of the things with an asterisk are things that we have gotten permission to test. We've gotten permission to test personal cell phones. We've gotten permission to test cloud services. We've gotten permission by cloud services. I would not like your servers in the cloud, but like somebody saying, um, we want you to test Kinesis or Lambda or something. Like, you gotta leave those the hell alone, right? Um, unless you get permission from the cloud services to do so. Third parties. If you're testing a web portal and that web portal actually goes to another company for desktop support, yeah, you want to get permission on that. Um, personal devices. We've gotten permission from executives to go after family members and go after personal devices. And we've gotten sign off for those things over the years. One thing that you should never do ever is DDoS testing. Now, a long, long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far, far away, Black Hills Information Security would try to do DDoS testing, where a bunch of testers would get up in the middle of the night and we launched DDoS testing attack tools against a customer's network. Now, this is one of those things that you can look at and be like, well, John's an idiot. And you're not wrong. I was an idiot. And when we're looking at this, you know, it was one of those areas that customers were very concerned about and they were willing to pay money for. And the consequences of doing something like that weren't exactly manifest. The consequences of doing something like distributed denial of service testing is you can do that testing against a customer, but you can have downstream impacts to the internet service provider and their capability to actually transfer data or multiple internet service providers. So you need to be thinking in terms of if I'm testing X, what is the pathway to, for me to get to X? Think trace route, for lack of a better term. And what are the potential impacts for doing that? If I'm launching a standard exploit under SSL TLS, there's almost no chance of it impacting an ISP, as an example. If, however, I'm launching a DDoS attack, yeah, now all of a sudden we have that potential impact on those ISPs. So this is kind of beginning in the section of, you know, what's going to kill you? And as you see, I love this sign. It says, not only will this kill you, it will hurt you the whole time you're dying. Um, so we need to be ultra careful when we're looking at what are the potential downstream impacts to things like ISPs. Because years ago, when I was testing like in my basement, you know, when we first moved back to South Dakota, we didn't actually, when I first moved back to South Dakota, I was just teaching for SANS. Um, we only had like two vehicles. We had a pickup truck and a van. And the van that we were running was completely infested with mice. And I like got into a patch of ice and I wrecked the pickup truck. We had like no vehicles. Like my dad had to lend us an absolute jalopy. We had, you know, just enough money to survive for a month. And um, I, uh, I, you know, I, th I think at the time I had $25,000 in credit card debt. This is when I found in Black Hills Information Security. So whenever you have a customer that's like, hey, we want you to do DDoS testing, we're going to write you a check for $20,000. It's like, hey, my family gets to eat. Um, and yeah, we did actually impact their ISP. Luckily, when we stopped, everything went back to normal and the ISP was cool with it. And they realized they had an issue on their backbone. Um, but 
that was a positive outcome. You know, the ISP actually ended up doing testing with us over the years, but um, it could have been much, 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 much worse. They could have thrown the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, against us for causing damages to protect the computer systems, but they didn't. And looking back after we got done with it, that's whenever me and like, I think we had two employees at the time. Um, that's whenever we were like, holy crap, this could have gone really bad. And we altered our course of action on how we did testing. Once again, back then, there was tons of firms that were doing this type of testing. It wasn't something that people thought about all that much as well. So scope. So whenever you're just talking about scope, what are you specifically allowed to test and what are you not allowed to test? You need to share the screen with the customer. You need to be filling out the scoping document at the exact same time so everyone sees the exact same things. And then when you're done, you share that document with the customer and there should be no except exceptions to this rule. You're going to send it and then the customer has to respond back and say, yes, they received the scope uh, document as well. <clears throat> at BHIS, we don't call it the doomsday file, but many people would refer to it as the cover your assets file. That communication thread between you and your customer needs to be documented. Um, like a text message uh, that maybe got turned over to an attorney that shouldn't have been turned over. But you need to be documenting these communication threads between you and your customer, okay? And I'm going to talk about this on the next slide here in just a little bit, but you're building this file. So if something goes sideways where the customer's like, we didn't know that you were doing that, you can literally pull up this communication file and share with them where the communication happened. If they're like, we didn't tell you to test that IP address, and you're like, Bill, it's here in this document and it's in this IP address, you need that level of protection to be in play at all time. So with this, one of the things that we're constantly pushing is the need to document everything. And email is that medium. It is. That's what email is great for. So you have a scope, share it via email. You have a call with the customer, awesome. Follow up with an email, something that says, hey, just to recap our phone conversation, um, you gave me authorization to test tonight between the hours of like 9 and 2 a.m. with our automated scan. Awesome. Don't ever, ever be in a situation where you're like, well, they called and they gave me permission. There's no proof. And it will turn into a he said, she said, or he said, he said, or she said, she said, wow, that was tough to say, a uh, situation very, very, very quickly, unless you have it documented in an email. Did you call them and miss them and got voicemail? Awesome. Follow up with an email. Say, hey, I just tried calling you, left a voicemail. Um, when you get a chance, please give me a call back. And we do this because we've had customers that say, well, the communication of Black Hills information security hasn't been great. Awesome. We can pull up a file and we can say we had a phone call on Monday. We tried calling you on Tuesday in the morning and there was no response. We tried calling you again two hours later. There was no response. We followed up to both of them with an email saying that we actually called you. Like you're going through and you're documenting literally like it's going to be a case where something bad is going to happen and you're going to need to pull this up. Like 99% or 90, let's say 95% of the time, nothing bad ever happens. But because you've gone through and documented it at this level, when things do go sideways, most of the time, the customer's like, oh yeah, right. I missed our stand-up meeting this morning. And I missed your call when you tried to get me on the stand-up meeting. And I missed your call an hour after the stand-up meeting. And I missed your call you know, at noon over, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, things are fine. I just missed these things. I apologize. As soon as people are confronted with an overwhelming amount of evidence, they tend to kind of back off their hardened stance as well. Now, there's things that are my pet peeves. Like, and this isn't just for testers, but a Black Hills information security. If someone's communicating with a customer and I'm like, hey, did the customer get back to you? And they say, yeah, I called and left a message last week. I lose my crap. I hate that. It's like, did you call today? Did you call yesterday? Did you call the week, like, you know, a couple of days before? Don't just do the bare minimum to say that you've tried. Where oh, I texted them like a month ago and they didn't respond. That's not okay. That's not okay. Don't say I emailed them last week and they have not responded. Once again, totally not okay. There should be that consistent communication with the customer, especially if you're missing something from the customer. And if they're non-responsive after like a day of follow-up and follow-up and follow-up and follow-up, escalate. Go up to management, 
go up like for BHIS, come to me, go to CJ, go to somebody that we can get somebody else on the phone. And if you get somebody else on the phone, you're like, Hey, um, we're trying to get a hold of bill. Is he out or something today? Because we tried calling him yesterday, like three, four times. There's no response. Then that communication kicks off on the inside. Don't worry about annoying customers with lots of phone calls. You're not trying to sell them an extended warranty for their car's insurance. You're not trying to tell them that diet Dr. Pepper tastes more like regular Dr. Pepper. You're literally trying to get permission to test and throw hacker tools at their environment. In person is better than video. Uh, it's, it's than a video chat. Phone is better than email. Text is better than literally anything. And Twitter and anything out there is better than Twitter. Okay. So let's talk about recon. Um, one of the things I think that is ignored, and I, I need to drive this home with more testers, recon isn't just trying to identify an attackable surface. Recon also exists to validate the scope that the customer gave you. So you can do recon and you can check and you can say, so we're testing a bank in Missouri. Did anyone notice when we were reconning their IP addresses that um, a bunch of them were like Russian like farm supply stores? Like, does that strike anybody as weird or is that just me? Um, or we had one situation where a customer gave us a range of IP addresses that were in Iran. Um, we had another customer that dropped a, 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 a digit off the front and all of a sudden they gave us IP addresses to test in DOD. I had a customer that literally gave us IP ranges and we validated the IP ranges. It was literally, there was a system that belonged to, to a casino that wasn't the casino that was set out to hire us. When we contacted our customer, like, so you gave us the slash 24 and we noticed, we just noticed that one of these systems belongs to another casino. And they responded with, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We let them use some of our IP address space. They rent that from us. Can you just go ahead and exploit all the IP addresses and find out which casino owns which IP addresses just so we know? And it's like, no, 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 we're not doing that. So use recon not just for identifying uh, vulnerabilities, but also going through and identifying scope issues. And yes, we literally had a customer. They didn't know where their IP addresses were. So they gave us these huge ranges because they figured they were in there somewhere. And they literally gave us IP addresses for half of Canada. So um, it's just some potpourri. Uh, one of the things I like to bring up is default scans. Um, if you look at default scans, you can definitely come up with a better scan than like something default from Rapid7, Qualys, or Tenable. You totally can. Um, you could tune them. You could make them better. Um, the defaults are lame. You could make them run faster. You could make them more effective. Don't change them. When you're testing, this is incredibly important. Do not F with the default scans unless you take something away. Like with our default scans, we actually disable authentication checks because that tends to crash people's systems. And the reason why we stick with the default scans is because if something goes horribly wrong, who's to blame? So let me give you uh, two separate examples. Let's say I'm scanning an environment and we bring down a fragile system and we are using a default PCI network scan. It's easy for me to say, this is a default scan. This is like the scan that's put out by like PCI, ASP. Like we did nothing but disable authentication checks. I think the issue isn't the scan profile, but rather your fragile system. Let's say that you hot rod your scans. You have a Nessa scan that's just, it's gorgeous. It's all things. It's beautiful. It's the beginning of artificial intelligence and vulnerability management. And you run that and it brings down a fragile system. Now, all of a sudden, the narrative in the conversation is your scan profile broke my system and good luck fighting your way out of that one. Now, I've had testers in the past. They disagree with me. This is actually a rule at Black Hills Information Security. And every damn time I've had a tester that's tried to disagree with me, eventually they get burnt and they're like, oh, I didn't run the default scan and I brought down their network. It's time to get out the cone of shame. I do not like the cone of shame. Put the cone of shame on. Next thing is web checks in your vulnerability scan. Turn them on. They're horrible. I mean, they're really not good. A burp, zap, any commercial scanning tool for web apps are much better. They're going to slow the scan down. Turn them on. And in many of the default scan policies for things like PCI, they're enabled. Turn them on. 
And the reason why is because contracts and coverage. If you're scanning and in the contract, it says you're going to check for web app vulnerabilities and they have 400 web servers and you shut off those scan checks, then you've just not checked for web vulnerabilities for 400 servers. You're going to be in breach of contract. This gets you to the point where you can make sure that you get at least adequate coverage per the contract language to make sure that you're testing the things that you should be testing. So turn on your web checks. Um, things that are gonna kill you, password attacks. Password attacks, like I would say out of like the five really bad days I've had at Black Hills Information Security, four of, no, three. Three of them were because somebody ran a password attack, brute force, and password spray, and they brought down a customer network. They're the worst days. Three of the worst days. The other two are coming up on the next slide. Three of the worst days came from this. So what I recommend you do is you want to slow things down. You want to spend some time communicating that rules of engagement and scope. And anytime you're doing a password attack, you need to say, hey, can I get your, your lockout policy? Thank you. Here's my scan policy. I'm going to do one password per every hour and 10 minutes. Based on your policy, I should be on the outside of that threshold. Do you agree that this is a scan that we should be able to do without issue in your environment? By the way, we can totally run this on off hours. You're going to move very, very, very slowly. If at any point when you're testing, you're like, the account policy lockout is five. I'm going to set my password to three this isn't going to be, congratulations, you're going to smoke a customer's network. So you need to constantly communicate and ask for these policies in screenshots and then ask other questions like, do you have any service accounts in your users group that may have a different account lockout policy associated with them? I'm asking for a friend. Um, you need to be very, very careful with password spraying. And you need to communicate with the customer very clearly what their policies are, what it is that you're doing. Get authorization on the scan profile that's being utilized. Communicate that there's always a possibility that things could crash. You need to do this because if this is going, if something's going to kill you, it's going to be this, right? Uh, other things that are going to kill you, much less of an issue, but it's still bad is bandwidth. Don't ever scan down a VPN. You want to have a host on the other side of the VPN that can scan that network segment. Don't try to send a Nessa scan through a VPN. It is just bad, bad, bad. You will crash the VPN adapter. The network stack on the Windows system or Linux system, if you're using it, is not going to be able to handle it. You're going to drop packets at best. You're going to kill the VPN service at worst. And yes, this is true on older internal networks. Um, we've had scans crash switches. Um, one of my favorite customers out of California, I love these guys. We were scanning their environment and we hit a switch. It was something like 15 years old and it died. And like some of the people in the company were all up in arms. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe you crashed the switch. And our customer is like, the direct customer point of contact is like, don't worry about it. We hate that switch. We've wanted to kill it for years. Thank you. So, you know, this stuff happens. This stuff happens. Um, old systems. One of the things I always tell people at BHIS is ask. Like, you should ask this question and it should be documented in the ROE and our template it is. Ask questions like, so any old systems from 2008 that we should know about? What are the top five systems that keep going down in your environment? And what are their IP addresses? You know, you want to know, have, have any other tests that you've done crashed any computer systems? And usually how the conversation goes is like this. So you guys have any fragile systems? No, no, we don't. Um, do you have any systems that are like old from 2008 or earlier that, you know, might have? No, no, we don't have anything. Do you have like maybe top five systems that go down? No, no, no. In previous pen tests, have the pen testers brought anything down? They're like, oh, oh yeah, our HR portal, it goes down to every pen test. You're like, oh God, no. Oh. You've got to go through and ask this question. I'm not kidding in four or five different ways every single time, every single time, and then document it thoroughly. All right. Um, compliance mapping, this one's super easy. If you ever have a customer that's like, can you map it to a compliance standard? Use the Center for Internet Security, bump the price of the contract up by 10% and just document as you go. It's seriously that easy. Just do it. Um, okay. So when things go wrong, I'm down to like a minute and I apologize. 
one of the things I want you to know is that things go wrong. It happens. I, I've been on the call with customers and they've literally been like, well, Pentest Company B says things never go wrong. I'm like, do you think that things never go wrong with them? Or do you think maybe, maybe just maybe they're lying to you? And they're like, oh, yeah. Be honest, right? Um, another favorite CJ quote is lose, but don't lose the lesson. Every time something goes wrong, you can look at it in a variety of different ways. You can look at it and you can say it's the customer's fault and not learn anything from it. But even if it is the customer's fault, were there any questions you could have asked the customer that could have like, like cut this off at the pass? There's always something that you can learn. And I wanted to give you like a little narrative about SANS. The reason why SANS was so amazing for me personally is if I had 100 students in a room, Okay, if I had 100 students in the classroom and I had all but one of those students give me perfect like five scores and that happened, right? I would have 99 that would give me perfect fives on the scores because they went from one to five. And I had one student that gave me threes. I would get a call from Stephen Northcott. I would get a call from Ed Scotus. And they would literally be like, hey, we noticed that you had a student that's not happy in your class. What can we do better? I could have gotten mad and been like, how dare you? 99 people love me. But by focusing on how you can always do better and being relentless in your pursuit to quality, amazing things come from it. Everything can be improved. Everything. How we prepare, how we react, how we spin. Oh, wow, we crashed the legacy system. Great. We'll be sure to note that in the report as a finding. You know, not sitting there and apologizing. I mean, this is clearly a problem. If it falls over with the NESA scan, that is something that needs to be addressed. And how can you turn a negative into a positive? How can you turn a negative into a positive? Like I said, I'm sorry. We're going over a little bit. I hope that this is okay. Reporting, always screenshot. Um, never copy just text of a scan result and then the output. You always want to have screenshots. If you want to do both, that's fine, but never do just te text because if it's just text, a customer will ultimately tell you, ah, you could have lied. You could have modified it. Screenshots are harder to make those arguments about. It's like, for example, if you say that you didn't have any text messages on a topic and then someone shows you a screenshot of those text messages in court, that's really hard to argue with, okay? So always screenshot, um, always have those screenshot. Screenshot your tool configurations. So you can say with Nessus, this is the scan policy that we utilize, here's a screenshot of it, never use text. Methodology is key, tell that story. And I wish I had more time to drive this point home, but I think it's a good point to kind of close it out on, but never, ever, effing, ever copy and paste between one test report to another, like ever. Um, all the way back in 2009, I had a tester who's no longer with the firm that copied and pasted between two tests and polluted the results from one test report to another. And I flew out to DC to have a report debrief with the customer. And I spent two hours in the room with the customer saying, this system is not ours. Like, what is this? In that report, the tester polluted the name of the previous customer over. It was two of the most painful hours I have ever spent. The other two bad days that I've had at Black Hills Information Security were copying and pasting between reports and there was pollution. Never, ever copy and paste, like freaking ever between two reports. This is a fireable offense at Black Hills Information Security, and it should be at every firm. And I, I've never been so embarrassed in my life as sitting down with a customer for two hours and like, here, we got this IP address. Is this ours? Is this ours, John? Is this ours? Is this ours? Because the other ones weren't. Are you sure that this is ours? It's a horrible day. The customer never came back. And that customer talked to other people in the space and talked about how horrible we were. And I want to be honest with you, they weren't wrong. I can tell anybody that's here that's heard that story from that customer, we're better now. Um, but it was painful. It was absolutely painful. And it, it's like 15 years ago, and it still wakes me up in cold sweats. Um, when it comes to reporting, I can only throw you at B.B. King, who is the master. Uh, you know, his, his uh, testing for show, reporting for Doe webcasts are absolutely amazing. Uh, look for his webcasts online.
I would also encourage every tester out there to go to noredink.com, set up an account and go through it. It's going to help you practice and it's going to greatly improve your writing. So please take advantage of it. Um, reporting frameworks. Um, I just want to throw a shout out to our friends at PlexTrack. We don't use PlexTrack and it's not that, th that they suck. It's just that we're so ingrained into our legacy reporting templates and everything that we have set up. Um, but working with something like PlexTrack or reporting framework will help reduce the copy and pasting. It'll help you reduce um, your reliance on trying to write things up. It'll bring consistency to what you're doing. So please have a framework for your testers that you can use. Finally, the debrief meeting, you're going to have it set up as multiple audiences, plan up front in pricing. And then the, one of the things that I love about the Black Hills Information Security methodology is the way that we document is screenshot, screenshot, screenshot. How do we get to where we're at? One thing leads to another, which leads to a vulnerability, which leads to an exploit, which leads to access to something sensitive. We tie all of that together in our methodology and our debrief meetings are great. Like, there's not a lot of questions. There's not a lot of people arguing, well, how did you actually get that? Did, can we see the steps that you got? It's all there. It's all documented in the report. And they go a lot faster. And ultimately, at the end of the day, leave it open-ended and basically say, please feel free to contact us and mean it. Mean it. Actually work with your customers. Um, you have a responsibility to them even after the test is done. All right. With that, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I don't know what we have for questions. And uh, by, the, by the way, we got Darth Kevin is with us today as well. I, I am here specifically to wish you a happy birthday tomorrow. <laughs> That's fantastic. And you're I, so, so close to I, it. I'm 24 <laughs> hours off, right? Uh, you're 48 hours off, but you're close to that. I thought it was tomorrow. <laughs> Damn it. So last week when I did my webcast, we all discussed it and we decided that the right thing to do, mm -hmm. and is everybody mm -hmm. unmuted? Because mm -hmm. I'm he not doing this by myself. We're no, going to do this. Uh, yeah, we're doing it again. Doing it now. Doing I it now. muted last time. I'm going to mute this time too. No, <laughs> no. You're his brother. I, that's exactly why. This is his birthday present is I'm not mm -hmm. going to. We're all going to say we're <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> well, you don't want gonna... me singing either if that's the thing. Okay, we'll is everybody ready? Megan, I see you muted still. So I'm calling you out. <laughs> So, right. Okay. Ready? One, two, three. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. <laughs> Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Beautiful. Happy birthday to you. John, yesterday morning, I had a what conversation. With this leg. <laughs> <laughs> I had a conversation with my daughter yesterday and I said to her that the list of people that I actually love is not very long. And this is not melodramatic. This was just, you know, people throw the word love around quite often. And my list is not very long. And your pretty brother is on to it. the top. Oh, no shit. Sorry. So <laughs> I love you, John. Thank you for living long enough to be older. <laughs> And now I'm going to go back to work because I also have a job. You know, it's a, mm. Since you started singing happy birthday to now, we've lost 100 participants from this. I, believe it. That is I correct. totally believe it. I'm amazed That's everybody facts. didn't drop off at that point. That is correct. Dropping like flies. Yeah. Love you, man. Talk to you later. Thanks, I will Kevin. see you next week, right? What's that? I will see you next week in Vegas. You will not. I am not going to Vegas. F that. This is my <laughs> first time going to Vegas in years for DEF CON. Yeah, no, I, I, I got to be honest. It's it's going to take a lot. It's probably going to take like a Baltimore or an Orlando uh, to get me to get on an airplane anymore um, or BrewCon. I'm going to be at BrewCon, uh, Charm and uh, B-Sides Orlando. Um, but uh, I, even RSA, dude, I don't I don't know. I, yeah, I just I don't do RSA. Not, I'm not feeling, I'm not feeling a lot of conferences at the moment and I'll probably get better, but I had a bad conference experience. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. We'll talk so. later. We'll talk later. Okay, man. Goodbye. Thank Thanks, you for Kevin. letting me do this. Uh, Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye. All right. With that, are we ready to kill it? Everybody? Uh, yeah, there's a ton of questions, but I don't think we can go through already. questions. I've got time. If we want to go through questions, do we want to uh, do that? Here's a real simple one. What kind of bike is that in the background? <laughs> Um, so these are uh, these are bikes that uh, we we basically don't ride anymore at home that we ship down here. 
Um, one of them is a salsa spearfish. Um, the other one is a trek. I want to say it's a slash seven. Um, I can't remember what. And then the middle one is just a, a fat uh, trek, and I can't remember exactly what it is. But uh, the bike I ride at home is a salsa horse thief. And my wife, I think she rides a top fuel, uh, is the bike that she rides. Uh, but those are the bikes that we have. So what other questions do we have? Uh, people have, you, have you encountered a client that asked to test a few systems, and it turns out that the assets were hosted and managed by a third party that testing were going to be in place and not happy about that, aka they wouldn't authorize the test. No, and we've had that happen. And usually by doing our scoping and rules of engagement and the questionnaire that we have, um, we actually have that as a question in there because that's burnt us in the past. And we literally asked that point blank to our customers. And in the class, like the intro to pen testing class, you know, you've got a small section of it, um, but we go into a lot more detail about avoiding that problem. Or trying to avoid that problem because even when you ask it point freaking blank a lot of times like no no and then you find out like oopsies we probably should have told you that um but that goes into that cya folder if the other firm gets mad you can be like look this is what they gave us as a range um so you can you can look at it there so uh, when is the next intro to pen testing class, John? Um, right now, it's on, in on demand. Um, it should be live and on demand. And I think if Megan, correct me if I'm wrong, the next Deadwood. time that we, is in Deadwood. Deadwood. Yeah. This will be the first time, folks, that I've taught live in person in I think four years. Uh, so if you want to come to Deadwood and you want to see the class and you want to like see what it's like, take a class from me. Uh, come out to Deadwood. It'll be a great time. Check it out. Okay. <laughs> and with that. Brian, do you have any questions that you want to ask? Me, specifically? No, yes. not you, like from the audience. Brian. Oh, oh, from this, uh, <laughs> no, you know, Brian. there's a, how, John, how long do you want to be here? <laughs> I, I could stay another 15 minutes, I think, I suppose. So, um, I'm trying to find a one that's not like, War and peace here. Oh, for physical penetration tests, do you all have a sample of documents to share to minimize the likelihood of things going legally wrong? Yeah, absolutely. So you, once again, you go back to the rules and gauge scope, and there's actually a section in there um, that specifically talks about does law enforcement need to be notified? What is or get out of jail free card? The limit it minimizes the risk, but it doesn't completely get rid of it. But uh, it is something that should be there. So somebody asked a question about the five by five rule. Do you expect each pen test to take no more than five minutes of elapsed time? I don't think they quite understood what that no, no, no. was, was conveyed. Five by five. So let's say that you have 150 vulnerabilities that you're going through, right? Some of them you can just find very, very, very quickly. And you can say, oh, there's a Metasploit exploit for that at work, move on. Um, but if you start finding things that are really weird, let's say anonymous FTP is enabled and it's a web server. One of the things you're going to want to do is upload a web shell to it and then see if you can force browse with dot dot forward slash dot dot forward slash dot dot forward slash like var log and then access your web shell. Um, you want to try that, but you don't want to spend the entirety of your test trying to look at that one vulnerability. So what you're going to do is try five things, five minutes or three one. things in three minutes and then move on. So we're not talking about the test should only be five minutes long. We're saying out of all the vulnerabilities that you're looking at, some of them are going to catch your interest and you shouldn't get stuck on just one vulnerability that you're researching at the beginning of the test at the expense of the rest of the test. So here's another one. And I, I think I know your answer to this one, but I like it. That's why I'm asking it. So for burnout, how do you manage an eight hour workday with studying for search such as OSCP and keeping up with mm -hmm. new technologies? So I'm going to warn you, if you're doing studying in almost any company that you're doing, that self-improvement that you are doing is going to be a, um, it's going to be something that you take with you forever. So if you get your OSCP, if you get your CISSP, if you go to anti-siphon and you do cyber range, that the company is never going to take those away from you. So when you're trying to improve yourself, I expect anybody that's going for certifications or things like that to spend that on their own time. Um, but there's a caveat to that, okay? I expect them to do that on their own time if they're going for it. If, however, let's say we have uh, one of the things we need more testers for is mobile app web pen testing, right? 
if your company requires you to have that skill and it's specific to your job and it helps the company, the company should absolutely be paying to send you to the training and getting you access to that training, giving you the time to do that training um, to actually fit that specific gap and need at your company. And there should be a dedicated amount of training associated with it. So there's a difference between training and then studying for the certification. Training time should be on the company's dime. Getting your time for the training certification should be something that is expected for you because you get that certification moving forward. Cool. Um, how do we? How does a company sign off on going after family members? We've had personal people like yeah, high you profile can individuals, all family members. So, like yeah. if they say go after the CEO and their spouse, uh, C-Os and their spouses, we need to get sign off from every single C-O and their spouses before we do it. And that's rare. That doesn't happen all the time. I want to make that very clear. Yeah. Um, man, some of these are really long. I don't want to sit here and read. <laughs> um, hey, so John, uh, someone's curious about your four day work week. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts on a four day work week? Oh, okay. So we're trying to find ways to make HIS a better place to work. Mm -hmm. And Continue. <laughs> like this, <laughs> carry on. Um, and it boils down to a four day work week has two separate things that you can look at it, right? We could have everyone work four nines and you basically are reducing or four tens or whatever, but you're still reducing the total amount of work that people do, which is something that we're seriously thinking about, right? That is something that there's been tests and they say that productivity improves. Um, there's also just saying four tens. You can do four tens and then you can take every Friday off. That's fine. Um, but ultimately, what we like to do at Black Hills Information Security is if you can work four tens and you don't have any customer meetings or anything that you need to attend on Friday or Monday or Wednesday or whatever, do it. You have that flexibility in your schedule as an employee working from home where you can do those things. No one is just like chained to their desk from a nine to five perspective. Now, we expect our testers and employees to be available if there's a phone call or a quick question. But seriously, if an employee wants to put and set up their customer meetings and set up all their testing and be done in four days and take off a Friday, that's absolutely something we don't have a problem with. Uh, and then can you talk a little more about the ROE template? Um, so our ROE template is really, really, really long. It's like, if it's a vulnerability analysis, here's the questions that you need to ask the customer. If it's a pen test, here's the questions that you need to, um, uh, you need to, you need to ask as well. So, um, it's a template that I give out to all of my students in the intro to pen testing class, uh, as well. So. Right. All right, John, I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you so much okay. for your time today. So Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Ten thing this week, and we're going to take tomorrow off, <laughs> the BHIS folks. Johnny, so. have any final thoughts for your rant today? No, it was it was a lot of fun. Good to be back in the webcast, and there'll be more webcasts coming up. Uh, so just sit, sit tight. Also, once again, go check out our Twitch, Anti-Siphon Twitch, because we're doing these little dense, like super technical nuggets. Please go sign up to it. Um, it, it, it means a lot to us. I don't quite understand how it all works but i know that signing up for our youtube channel and signing up for a twitch live stream is good for us it's good for you yeah it's like broccoli it, and i do want to just you know since you're still here if you ever need an active sock managed services you know where to oh, find yeah, that advertising oh, yeah. you're gonna have to talk to me unfortunately if you do yeah. that that's that's the only downside of the uh, active sock. Delightful. we also do incident response and pen testing i feel like we're sucking at this yeah um, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh all those, right bye Bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan, kill it with fire. Kill it. Kill it Turn it off. off.